All right. So I'm maybe I will get started and I'll maybe go slowly on this um, intro slide as folks continue to trickle in. Um, it's really nice to see, uh, well, to, to see everyone again and to see at least your introductions and your uh, welcomes in the uh, chat. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, as you hopefully know or probably know, this is the second workshop, workshop number two in our series of change and evaluation planning workshop series of three workshops total. Um, we're in the middle here. Uh, my name is Katie Cook and my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm a research and evaluation manager at the KDE Hub for folks who maybe didn't join us uh, the first time and are like, who the heck is this person? Uh, that's who I am. I'm very excited to have all of you here today for this second workshop. Um, before I jump into content and agenda and all of that stuff. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the land on which I am right now um, and the land on which I also live and work um, and thrive. Um, Renaissance University College uh, is located at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, um, which is located on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. Uh, we're located on the Haldeman Tract, which includes six miles on either side of the Grand River from sort of the top of the Grand River down to the bottom. Um, and I also acknowledge uh, my role and my own position as a non-Indigenous um, white person who is an uninvited guest on this land and um, try to reflect the, that and my ethics and, and values in the way that I move through the world, including um, in, in this work here in this very workshop. Um, so you're invited if you would, uh, would like to share uh, the land from which you're joining us uh, in the chat, if you would like to take a few moments to do that as we continue moving into our agenda for today. So um, today's agenda is really built around the questions, requests, kind of conversations that came out of the first session, um, including a couple of follow-up sort of requests, as well as what we heard and what I heard on the day of uh, in September when we had the first workshop. So we'll start by revisiting backward mapping in part one um, as a tangible tool. It's something that we talked about sort of closer to the end of the first session, and we'll talk about it as a tangible tool um, for getting started on and developing and refining your theory of change. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of being strategic and doing back like a modified backward mapping with an example. Um to hopefully highlight uh, what that can look like in practice. Then we'll move on to discuss um, some components and, and some issues related to defining and measuring outcomes um, and some of the complexities around that. Uh, we'll have a seven to 10 minute break, kind of depending on how we're doing uh, for timing around that time. Um, and then after the break, we have the whole second half devoted to going into breakout rooms um, with jam boards again, a similar uh, conversation or a similar approach that we took last time to discuss um, your own process and your own projects needs and process in thinking through outcome measurement, including creating connections between your projects activities uh, and the outcomes you you, you plan or, or hope to have to, to see in participants. Um, we do have a few opportunities before that second half for larger group reflection and discussion during the, the first the part one and part two. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from those of you who uh, do wish to participate in that format as well uh, in the first half. <clears throat> we'll end with some next steps, including planning for workshop, workshop three and some post-workshop -work uh, resources as well. So Annette is going to launch a poll here in just a second, similar to how we started last time. It's really helpful for me as a facilitator um, and hopefully for you to kind of see where each other is at. Um, but the question we're asking you in this poll is how are you feeling generally about your project's theory of change development process, no matter where you are in that process? Um, so Annette, you can go ahead and launch that poll. And then Annette will sort of, uh, once we get our responses in, Annette can uh, kind of maybe outline what, what we saw in, in our responses. Terrific. Thanks so much, Katie. And hi, everybody again. Uh, so you'll see the poll come up uh, and I see people are already starting to put in their responses. The question is, how are you feeling about your project theory of change development process? And feel free to select more than one response option. Are you feeling confident, overwhelmed, content, confused, unsure? Maybe a mix of those. So choose as many as are, um, you know, representative of, of where you're at in this process. And I'll just give you a, a few moments more to think about that and log in your responses. Okay, so um, it looks like about, so about, uh, so 14 people answered the question and about half of us here uh, who, who submitted responses are feeling content. 
um, and 36% or about five, uh, a little unsure maybe. Um, so thanks so much for your responses there. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm so happy to see the number of people who are feeling content and confident um, and also really excited to engage with folks who are kind of all over the map because you could be feeling both, um, you know, content and unsure or overwhelmed all at the same time. <laughs> um, great. Thank you, uh, everyone, for participating. Um, and last thing before I start to get into some content, I wanted to give an opportunity for folks to sort of um, just like ask any outstanding questions that you have or confusions from the content on the first workshop, um, anything that I presented or anything that we talked about in that workshop. So if you have outstanding questions about that, um, you can put them right into the chat. And then after we go through this first section, I'm going to pause again and look at the chat and we'll I'll, I'll give responses to some of those and we can kind of make sure we address any of those. Uh, it's really important for me as facilitator to make sure that we're all on, it may fall the same page, maybe just in the same book and, and that things aren't completely unclear before we really get into the uh, more in-depth parts of our, our content for today. So any outstanding questions from workshop one uh, that you have, throw them in the chat and in just a few moments, we'll revisit the chat and uh, Aneta will, will alert me to any questions that came up there. So uh, just a, a place to put those um, outstanding things before we uh, move right into to session two. So let's do some revisiting of backward mapping. As I said, this is where we will get started. Um, so as we discussed in the first workshop, this slide is, 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 is a, a rerun uh, from the first uh, workshop. But as we discussed, backward mapping can be a very helpful starting point for creating a theory of change um, or, or working with a theory of change. So essentially backward mapping, uh, when we're doing backward mapping, we're starting with um, our overall effect or impact that we wish to have, that we hope to have at that general level. And we go backwards from there to ask, okay, so what do we need to do in order to see that impact? We start with, you know, what outcomes or long-term outcomes do we need to see? in order to achieve our project's overarching goal or impact. Um, and then we might ask after that, okay, so then how will we know that we've achieved those outcomes? What are our indicators of those outcomes? And then moving backwards from there, we might ask, okay, so in order to see those outcomes, what audience do we actually need to reach? Who do we need to uh, affect? Who needs to take part in our, in our project's activities in order to, in our project, in order to see those outcomes? Um, and then of course, uh, leading all the way back to, okay, so what activities do we need to do? What do we need? What does our project have to look like? What does our programming have to look like in order to then achieve those, um, those outcomes, those sh uh, long, medium and short term outcomes. So just to add to this and kind of expand on this very like initial idea of backward mapping that we already covered last time, <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge the unique position that your projects are that you're all in. Um, because as you develop your theories of change and your subsequent evaluation plans, your projects are already offering, you're already doing your activities, right? You've defined activities and you're doing them probably every day or, you know, frequently. Um, so those activities are already defined, even though, of course, I'm sure they have shifted. We know everything has shifted in the past couple of years and our activities are, are shifting as, as we move, you know, offer them in different contexts. But the foundations of the activities that you're offering, what your projects do are already likely defined and happening. Um, so purely backward mapping doesn't really maybe make sense just to go backwards because you already know, you can already fill out those activities, right? You can already write down, this is what we are doing. So one thing I want to um, suggest is that you could start, if you're just getting started in this theory of change process, you can start with activities and you can just write those down. These are the things that we do. Um, and then maybe go forward into impact and then work backwards from there, right? So go to impact and say, okay, so what impact do we want to have? And then you can go back and forth then between activities and impact to build out those outcomes. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but just to acknowledge um, you're in a unique position for backward mapping and that you know what your activities are. You're doing, you're doing the thing already, right? So last time, like I said, we covered that previous slide, um, but I hadn't um, offered mainly due to time. Um, I hadn't offered like a specific example of like, okay, but so like that's backward mapping. What does it actually look like in practice? What, are, what is the process? Um, so just as a very quick example, this is a, a made up program. I used this example last time as like an early literacy program for children. So let's backward map that very, very quickly. Um, so if my overarching impact that I, my overarching goal of my, my programming, my early literacy program, I want to see that children are equipped to succeed throughout their elementary school years. That's the overall impact that I have defined. 
But of course, this is an overarching impact um, in that, you know, it's not measurable. How do I, how do I even operationalize equipped to succeed, right? Um, so we need to go and make this a little bit more measurable. We need to, to define what outcomes do I need to achieve? What measurable outcomes do I need to achieve in order to lead to that impact, in order to, to see that impact happen? So here I've defined, and this is just one long-term outcome. So you can think of this as like, this is not a complete theory of change I'm making here. I'm only mapping from one activity to the overarching impact. There, were, You have more than one activity, I'm assuming, in what you do. Um, this is just sort of like zooming in on one part of a theory of change. Um, so in order to reach to reach that impact, one of the long-term outcomes that I, I have defined that I would need to see is increased reading proficiency in children by the time they get to senior kindergarten. I know that that would lead to my impact. And of course, in moving backwards and doing our backward mapping, my next question is, okay, so what short-term outcomes, what needs to happen first in order to get to increase reading proficiency, right? It probably won't just happen. There's probably things, indicators that I need to see to know that we can then get to that behavior of increased reading proficiency. So I have here defined shorter term outcomes. Here I have two that are linked um, because these things are often complicated. And you can kind of see maybe we talked about feedback loops in that first session. You can kind of see maybe a feedback loop uh, emerging here. Um, so the two short term outcomes that I have done in my backward mapping approach to say, okay, so what do I need to get to increase reading proficiency? I need to see both increased enjoyment of reading aloud, so reading out loud, and also increase confidence in uh, your in the child's reading abilities that they themselves have confidence in their abilities. Um, now, how do I know that these two things are related to that long term outcome? There's lots of ways for me to know that. Um, there's lots of knowledges on which these um, these things can be based. For example. I may have reviewed previous literature, uh, previous research, and that shows that there is a relationship between increased enjoy between enjoyment of reading out loud, confidence in reading skills, leading to increased proficiency in reading or developing a proficiency in reading. That's one way I could say, okay, I know there's a relationship here. I've seen it in, in previous literature. It can also be based on lived experience as a service provider or as a service creator or implementer. Um, it can be based on the lived experience of community. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can uh, lots of different knowledges in which we can base these assumptions that we're making here and doing this backward mapping. Um, and just of note, in what I've just done is kind of described a little bit about how do I know that these arrows would be here, right? That's a kind of background knowledge. Um, and those are things, the things that I've just said about how do I know that these arrows should be here. These are the things that will go in that explanatory document that goes with the theory of change that we talked about in the, in the first, um, the first uh, session, the first workshop. So then finally, moving backward from there, I asked myself, okay, so what do I need to do? Of course, this is a simplified version. I would also be asking questions about reach and audience and all of that. Um, but to simplify things a bit, so, okay, I know what my desired short-term outcomes would be now. Um, what do I have to do in order to get there? And that is here leading back to the activity I need to offer, which in this case is my early literacy program for children aged two to five years old. Now, of course, if this was based on a real uh, program, I would have in that box actual activities, right? Like one-on-one um, -on -one reading skills sessions between a teacher and a student, or you know, I would have specific activities. This is just a made up example. So it's kind of vague, early literacy programs. My program specifically, which is for children aged two to five, um, is what needs to happen in order to realize these short-term outcomes as I've defined. So just as a very quick example of what backward mapping um, <clears throat> can look like. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you all have activities that you're already doing. You're in a unique position uh, with backward mapping. So it may be easier for you to fill in these activity boxes first, like start with activities, um, with what you're already doing, what activities are you doing in your, in your uh, project, in your programming. Um, and then you can go forward and say, okay, so what's the overall impact we want to have before we get into the messiness of outcomes? Uh, just start with, you know, what are my activities? What overall impact do we want to have uh, in, a, in a very general broad way? And then you can move back and forth between those activities and that impact to really determine not just what outcomes we want to see, but what outcomes are feasible. And we'll talk about that in basically the rest of today. We're really going to focus in on those uh, defining those outcomes and what outcomes are. Uh, but you can do that kind of back and forth here. You don't backward mapping doesn't have to just be backward. You can start with writing down what you're already doing and then kind of move back and forth uh, between these different components. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
So I want to pause here and um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a second so we can kind of have a bit of a like large group conversation reflection about this. Um, and then the chat check in will come after this. So if you did put questions in the chat that is coming. Um, but I want to pause here and just ask a few questions of you, like I said, in a large group setting to get an idea of sort of where you're at with this backward mapping process or just the development process generally. Maybe backward mapping isn't what you're doing or doesn't fit for your theory of change development. Um, so I'm the, in, for the questions that I've asked here, you can feel free to either put your responses in the chat once I stop the screen share, or you can turn on your mic, you can turn on your camera, whatever you're able to do, um, and uh, um, respond to these questions. So the questions that I'm asking here are, first of all, what might the process of backward mapping look like for your project if you haven't already undergone this process? And then second, um, or in addition, you can just answer one of these questions. How might you use this both forward and backward mapping? Is this something that kind of connects for you in developing your theory of change, starting with your existing activities and moving back and forth um, with your impact? Uh, so I'm going to stop my screen share so I can see all of your faces for folks who have their cameras on. Um, any takers, maybe we can do uh, raised hands so we don't miss anyone or uh, put your responses in the chat and we can see them there. Is this question maybe too big to start with? Any initial thoughts or just even thoughts of like, hey, backward mapping really doesn't feel like a good way to start, but also I don't know where to start. So can we talk about that? <laughs> Maybe you might see the question from Magali. Mm -hmm. Would you like yeah. To read it out? <clears throat> yeah, I can read it out here. So the question is about in theory, you'd like to have um, all partners around the table to develop or review the theory of change that's already been drafted. But in practice, that's really hard to do. Um, it's hard enough to engage a, a team member or two. Um, how do you sell? That's a really interesting question. How do you sell? So is the issue here that maybe you've put out the um, like opportunity to be involved, but folks just haven't taken you up on it? Like it's just not something that people have kind of signed up for or been involved in the conversation. Uh, is that the, is that that's the nature of the question? So I didn't even go that far. So I managed to bring together two other team members and we mm -hmm. uh, went through those questions from Noble et al. Mm -hmm. yep. So we have some sort of draft there. So I think all the elements from our side are there, but then um, the, the members who were involved in drafting things are very, very reluctant to burden the sites with engaging in it, reviewing it. It's a long document. It's uh -huh. so, and I'm, I'm still not convinced that it's going to be use, directly useful or meaningful to them. Mm. Yep. And I'm not sure how to approach that. So we found some roundabout ways, but it's not going to be like a big group team project like yep. I had hoped, like I had to um, tone down my, my things. Yeah, that's really tough. And like, you know, of course, that depends so much on context and like, you know, the folks that we're trying to engage. And part of it could be, you know, maybe it's that. Um, you're leading the theory of change development process for the purposes of creating an evaluation plan. And maybe there's ways to engage folks with specific aspects of that as the evaluation components are rolling out, right? Because mm -hmm. really this is about developing an evaluation plan and the theory of, that is grounded in a, in a well-developed theory of change. Um, not to say that, of course, you know, if we can engage folks early, that's always great. Um, and part of it, like you, like you also mentioned, that is a... Um, like it's a, it's a complex document, like it is hard, like any theory of change, <clears throat> uh, both like the image itself and the written component that goes along with it. Like it's not super accessible. It's not an at a glance thing always. I mean, the image kind of is, but still requires conversation. Um, and especially in creating it. 
So it may be just deciding, like zooming in on a particular part of that, right? Like maybe it's zooming in on short-term outcomes and just having that conversation um, with the folks who maybe are most um, invested in short-term outcomes, whether that's particular service providers, particular team members, particular community members. And then maybe when we're talking about reach or audience, maybe we need to talk to like service users or a different audience, right? Like maybe we need to involve different stakeholders for that conversation. Um, that's, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me is like really trying to determine. That's very helpful. Thank you. It yeah, kind of validates, involve. Yeah. kind of validates a little bit the approach we've taken, which is yeah. to not show them the theory of change, but yes. to ask them specific questions when right. we meet with them, have discussions that then will inform the theory yeah. of change. So it's kind of collaborative and kind of not. Yeah. And I will, when we get to talking about outcomes, that'll, this will come up again about in, in terms of who do we engage, how do we engage when we're defining outcomes specifically, um, and what's meaningful, like sort of across the board, what's meaningful and, and what's helpful in that process, or what can be, of course, nothing, none of this is, is going to be the same for everyone, of course, it's all context specific, but we will talk, this will come up again. So thank you for, for asking this question. Uh, Katie, do you hear me? I have a question too. Yes. Yeah, so when I, I applied and submitted our application for second phase, based on the workshop that we had uh, on theory of change in 2021, mm -hmm. as per preparation for the application, we developed a theory of change model for our project, mm -hmm. which we included in our application. So um, my question here is for you, like that in that uh, theory of change model, we basically presented the diagram that mm -hmm. flows from the assumption to activities up to the impact, the long-term impact or the overall outcome that you say. So um, for as part of theory of change development, now do you need to, like what's the outcome? We present the diagram or we also write the narratives about how the, the impact, term and short-term uh, outcomes will be connected to the activities in details, we need to write a theory or like details, disc, you know, I mean, description. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, this actually also relates to another question I see in the chat. So thank you mm -hmm. for, for highlighting this question. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, I mean, in terms of what you need to do, mm -hmm. I, I, as far as I can tell, you don't need to even submit the theory of change. It's more mm -hmm. about the evaluation plan needs to be grounded in a well-developed theory of change. So it's really in terms of the depth of the theory of change and what you create, it's about what's usable, <laughs> helpful, um, and relevant for mm -hmm. your evaluation planning. I think that's the like overall key message here. Mm -hmm. In terms of the differences you're highlighting, you're partially highlighting the differences between a logic model and a theory of change. Mm -hmm. So it's really, um, really great observation and, and, and question on your behalf. Mm -hmm. When we have a descriptive image, so the, to me, one of the biggest differences between the logic model and the theory of change is logic models tend to be more descriptive, sometimes purely descriptive, saying, here's what I'm going to do, here's the outcomes I want to have, yeah. and here's the overall impact, end of story, this is, this is what things look like. Whereas with the theory of change, we're getting more detailed into explaining those arrows. How do I know that this activity mm -hmm. is going to lead to this outcome? What is the logic behind the logic model? What is the theory behind why this works for whom under these circumstances in this context? It's that more analytic, it's that more descriptive yeah. piece that makes it a theory of change. And so the reason why that's important for evaluation planning is because being able to answer those questions about your logic model, about the, the model that you're creating will highlight, okay, then how do we actually measure these things, right? It's easier to measure something when you know why that something is there, right? Like if I know why this activity is related to this outcome and I know why this outcome is related to a long-term outcome, that might give me some um, direction for how I, how I can measure those outcomes. What indicators would I be looking for of those outcomes? And then how can I measure for whether or not those indicators are present, right? Um, so that's really, I mean, that, I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, really but I have, it, yeah like the, the thing I wanted to know, say, for example, I took the lead uh, uh, in designing our project. Mm -hmm. So the, the logic is in my brain. Yes. So I'm just wondering whether I need to document that, like how, like say okay. why, yeah my project will lead to the intended outcomes mm -hmm. and how the the activities are connected to short term mid term and long term outcomes do i need to document somewhere or i Great question. based on my based on my like, search of the literature my education mm -hmm. and learning about the, the things that we are doing 
we have learned based on that we designed the project so but yeah. the question is do we need to document them or simply just we demonstrate them to a to a diagram that we presented yeah so this isn't this isn't an easy yes or no in terms of what you need to do, as far as I can tell, what like what needs to be submitted to the Public Health Agency of Canada, you do. As far as I can tell, you do not need to write all of that down. Mm -hmm. um, however, in terms of like planning for a, a really thorough evaluation, mm -hmm. it is a very good idea. Of course, all of this depends on capacity and all of those things, right? Um, none of none of the suggestions I'm making are necessarily easy. Um, insofar as you are able, mm -hmm. writing those things down and, and writing that theory behind the, like writing the theory of change, the, the theory behind the image, the, the logic model, mm -hmm. um, is very important. At the end or towards the end of the first session, we talked about some of the benefits of creating a theory of change. And one of those was about uh, like communication and clarity. And mm -hmm. uh, I talked about institutional memory so that someone mm -hmm. else could come in in the future and really understand uh, mm -hmm. those connections. Maybe someone who doesn't have the same knowledge, wisdom, lived experience that you have, mm -hmm. um, they would come in with some understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has inherent value for project longevity beyond just fact requirements, if that makes sense. I want supplementary question if somebody else does have. So ultimately, when in the, the, the PME plan that we'll be submitting will be similar to the one that we submitted for the first phase. Um, I don't I don't know what was submitted for the first phase, so I, I can't answer that directly. Um, it, what needs to be submitted is what like like FAC has, has provided those like what needs to be submitted. Yeah, there are columns that we submit like we included the, the identified mm -hmm. the indicators along the, the short term and long term outcomes and then how we measure the the indicators this kind of information and then the data collection methods and then how frequently we'll be collecting the data this kind of information we included in the pme plan yeah. so basically the thing is that we identify the indicators to measure like the the, the outcomes that we will be measuring right and then how we what step we take how you uh, measure them yeah. to measure them and how we collect data and then how we <sighs> collect data this kind of information we included in the pme plan so it will be similar to that one that we uh, worked on the last um, in, the, in the in phase one. I mean, yeah, I, like I, I wasn't um, I wasn't here in phase one. I don't I don't have a, the most familiarity with what you submitted from what I uh, understand. And mm -hmm. you know, others can correct me. And Emily, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. I see your hands up. Mm -hmm. um, is that there are some maybe some differences and there is some uh, maybe wording changes or, or requirement changes in terms of like what those columns are. But it is very similar from like I, I have looked at the two and from what I can remember mm -hmm. off the top of my head, I of course didn't complete one myself based on my own projects. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't go through the process, but they are mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're exactly like the same, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to Emily because I saw that your hand was up and I just want to make sure yeah. I don't lose that. Oh, you just turned your mic off, Emily. Thanks. Um, so I was just going to share that on our project, we've been using a realist evaluation approach, which um, is uh, a similar way, I suppose, of mapping out uh, the theory of change, um, drawing on um, theoretical knowledge, um, experience, um, those kinds of things, other types of literature and um, evidence that existing out there. And then for us, we develop um, what's called uh, initial program theories. Um, so for each kind of element, um, and so I'm trying to think of what that might be called in your backwards mapping process, but um, for each of kind of the outcomes of interest, we would have um, what we would call mechanisms um, and uh, looking at how those mechanisms lead to particular outcomes based on theory um, or other forms of knowledge. And so um, and just sharing because that's one other kind of space where there's some literature that aligns really well with the approach that you're describing. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and this is one of the great things about, you know, creating a theory of change and creating an evaluation plan, your evaluation approach in some ways, it kind of, I mean, it goes back and forth, same with how backward mapping is not just purely backward. Um, your evaluation plan will in some, some ways dictate or inform what your theory of change looks like. And your theory of change, your, your project theory, what you're doing will inform what kind of evaluation plan is a feasible and be helpful for you, right? What questions do you need to ask? What would you like to know? Um, we can't ask all the questions. So what questions will give us the information that will be most helpful? 
Um, thank you for that. That was that's really helpful uh, sharing. Um, and I see um, <clears throat> Megalie has made a suggestion here that you reached out to the FAT coordinator, and that was helpful. So maybe reaching out in terms of clarifying the differences between the the phase one plan and the phase two plan and what you need to submit. So um, I'm going to start my screen share again, just to kind of keep us moving and also acknowledging that um, a lot of what we are talking about right now is, is going to roll into the rest of our conversation. So we're certainly not leaving this here. Um, things will get a little bit, we'll get a little deeper into all of this stuff as we go, especially as we start to focus on outcomes. Uh, so let me just go back to sharing my screen. We should be seeing my slides again. And I think I saw, Annette, I saw a message from you saying there were not questions from last time. Um, I think I reviewed the chat. I think maybe we're good to move forward here. Annette, can, maybe you can let me know if I'm... Yep, uh, no, nope. uh, nothing to specific to workshop number one. Great, perfect. Okay, let um, just do a quick time check. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> So we're going to get into moving uh, into measuring outcomes. We are a little bit behind on time, but we that's okay. The conversation is really why we're here. Um, and so if I need to, if we need to cut some off of later or whatever, we have lots of wiggle room here. Um, our break may just come slightly later than we initially planned for, just, just noting that. Um, because first I want to get into this outcome stuff, measuring outcomes. Um, not just measuring outcomes, but first like defining outcomes. Um, so just quick refresher from last time before we start talking about outcomes. The reason I'm I'm really going into outcomes here is because I know that I think across all of the breakout rooms last time, complexity around even defining, let alone thinking about measuring outcomes, was a common question, even concern or barrier in, in the groups, as well as in the report back. So we'll really focus in on there um, for the rest of this second session. Um, so as a, just a quick reminder from last time, um, <clears throat> the outcome is the effect that we hope that our program has or we plan for our program to have on folks who are participating in the program or in the project. Um, we can define short, medium, and long term. Generally speaking, of course, none of this, um, I always say, like I, I teach here at the university, whenever I'm teaching, I always say like, I live in the gray area. So you'll always hear me saying like, none of this is really set in stone. None of this is, um, and I know that can feel overwhelming when you're like having information given to you and also being told at the same time that it's kind of all um, blurry, but I mean, that's the reality of, of all of this, right? It's all blurry and it's all um, not as clear cut as it may look on a slide. But generally speaking, um, our short-term outcomes are generally um, uh, measuring knowledge. So have we changed somebody's knowledge about something or information that they know about uh, whatever we're trying to measure? A median term outcome looks at attitudes and beliefs. So when people know better, do they think differently about something? Do they have different uh, opinions, attitudes, beliefs about that thing? And then longer term is where we look at really measuring behavior. So has their behavior changed as a result of that? And behavior can include things like literacy skills. It's more of a skill than a behavior, but how a child is reading would be the behavior that we're measuring in that long term. One thing I do want to note here in terms of moving beyond satisfaction, um, of course, there's nothing wrong with measuring satisfaction. Um, and when I say satisfaction, I mean, essentially measuring, uh, asking participants, did you like the program? Were you satisfied with the activities that we did or the, the project that we that you took part in? And of course, this is helpful, but it's certainly not enough. It can be very valuable to understand what aspects of our program participants like and enjoy and are satisfied with. That's, of course, an amazing starting point, and it's very important. It's also important to take a step back and think about what this is actually telling us um, and what else do we do we need to ask about in order to maybe move beyond just the, you know, do they like it or not? Um, so would satisfaction tell us, for example, that our program is working in the way that we intended it to work? Um, Maybe partially, but probably not fully. Satisfaction really certainly doesn't tell us the whole story. Participants may really enjoy the, the, the activities that they're taking part in because uh, they are, for example, a great opportunity to socialize, let's say, and that might be something that they were they, they look forward to every week. But if our overarching goal, our desired impact of our program is to improve, let's say, parenting confidence and skills, um, knowing satisfaction, knowing how much parents liked being there doesn't tell us about whether or not we've achieved a change in confidence, parenting confidence and skills. So we need to be, move beyond sometimes, often, just thinking about did people like the, the project? Were they satisfied to specific measurable outcomes? And this is where we get into, of course, the, the messiness of measurement. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm presenting this table um, because one of the issues that was expressed during the first workshop when it comes to outcomes um, was how to define and measure these outcomes at different levels of analysis, including community level outcomes, like moving beyond the individual to community and even structural or systems level outcomes. So this table that you see on the slide here might be familiar. It's adapted from a hub tool that was created and shared in 2021. And the tool was sent out in advance of today's workshop as well. Um, but of course, no worries if you if you didn't review it, uh, you're not going to be tested. But my main point uh, here is just to remind folks that this is a very helpful tool um, and that it exists. And it could really be helpful in, in defining those outcomes or thinking, even not even defining, but thinking through what outcomes look like at different levels of analysis beyond just the individual. Um, so what you'll see here are um, suggestions of what outcomes could be measured or could be defined at these different levels from individual to community to structural. Um, and of note, it might not be possible to measure the impact of one specific project or programming on really large systems level um, components, especially in a small amount of time, and that's okay. Part of defining outcomes is understanding the reach and really being realistic about the reach of your program and what is feasible to measure. So for example, maybe it's not feasible to measure the impact that your project could have on, let's say like large scale political structures and social structures, but maybe it is possible to directly measure the impact your project is having on, let's say access to, to cultural activities, access to culture generally, or uh, the accessibility of affordable housing in a particular community or area. Those are still community level, larger scale that are informed by structural, but they're not as nebulous and hard to measure as like large scale political change. Uh, these are by no means an exhaustive list of outcomes at these varying levels of analysis. Uh, they're simply some of the sample out, some sample outcomes uh, to act as sort of a starting point in thinking through what levels of analysis and measurement could look like. <clears throat> Moving on in our outcome conversation, um, I provided this graphic because this is what the Public Health Agency of Canada is using to outline what outcomes that projects could consider measuring. And of note, uh, there is a requirement that each project measures um, your impact on at least one of the protective factors for mental health listed here. Um, I know that this image is kind of hard to see, so I've actually laid it out on the next slide. Um, these protective factors here are laid out in a little bit um, clear way. Um, so on the left side of this slide, we have uh, those protective factors from the previous slide, just hopefully in a, in a clear layout. Um, the ones that uh, FAC has provided. And these factors are laid out through the different life phases, um, as you'll see going from best start to life right through to healthy aging. Um, however, as far as I can tell, FAC has not specified that you need to measure just the outcomes at the in the like early childhood, youth, you know, uh, mental health area. Um, protective mental health area. Um, so, uh, you know, if there is a an outcome, one example here is locus of control is only included in the living well, which is like the like older adult kind of area um, before we get to seniors. But if that's something that's useful to measure that is relevant to your project activities, increasing locus of control or feelings of control over one's life, um, you know, that's it, 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 it is included as a protective factor to be measured. So the protective factors that are green here, although I'm seeing that for some reason my formatting is showing up different um, in this moment than it did a half hour ago on my screen. Um, so the ones that are green, um, but add to that list agency or locus of control, instead of being bolded, that should be green. Um, those, those are green because they're all included uh, with example measures in the green box that's on the right side of this slide. Um, so the ones that are green, if you look over to the right, they're suggested <clears throat> or not even suggested, but example measures for measuring those outcomes. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I provided these examples, of course, not as a prescriptive list, but just as a resource or starting point. Uh, so one thing to note here, of course, is that the um, measures that I've suggested for potentially measuring these outcomes are all quantitative validated measures. Um, and these can be helpful in many different contexts. Being validated just means that it's been established that these measures accurately measure what they are intended to measure. Um, however, um, projects are encouraged by FAC to use qualitative and mixed methods as well. So this uh, box of example measures is not, of course, the only or even the best way to measure these outcomes necessarily. So for example, you may decide to use one of these validated or any validated scale <clears throat> or any quantitative measure. 
for that matter, to measure an outcome, but you may also wish to assess this outcome using a qualitative focus group with project participants. Uh, and this qualitative data can help to contextualize the quantitative findings from using one of these or any quantitative measure and can really help you get a deeper understanding of what these outcomes look like in context, in the context of your participants within your, um, your project. And then the last um, sort of content piece here and thinking about, we're just going to complicate things over and over and get a little deeper into the complication of all of this uh, before we have a conversation or hopefully we can then kind of parse out some of that complicated stuff is um, preparing to measure complexity. So there's a few different things um, involved in complexity. You are all experts in your own projects and your own context. Um, so therefore you're also experts in your own theories of change. Your projects and their desired outcomes um, are probably often messy and complex because that's the way things are. And I know that measurement can, all of this complexity can make measurement really difficult um, when we start moving from theory of change outcomes to actual evaluation plan. So a few things to consider when thinking through how the heck we're going to accurately measure this complexity. Um, the first is nested outcomes. So we can think about, we talked about levels of analysis a minute ago, um, but we can think about what levels of analysis um, are within level or levels are within the scope of our projects or your projects. So you may have an overarching uh, goal to let's say change the political climate, uh, but we need to ask, is this feasibly measurable? Um, maybe and maybe not. So what outcomes then are feasible given the reach of your project? This isn't to say that projects can't measure, that you can't measure outcomes at all of these higher levels of analysis, but rather to highlight the importance of thinking about feasibility and how all of these levels are nested within one another. Um, so we need to think about what we can directly measure. So for example, maybe you can feasibly measure outcomes for children, parents, and organizations. That's already three levels of analysis I've just defined um, and still create a nested um, analysis and nested out, nested outcome measurement that is meaningful for what your project does in the reach of your project. Moving on, when we talk about systems outcomes um, or structural level outcomes, again, we need to think through what is uh, feasible within the time frame of evaluation and of the project. Um, so what is the time frame for measurement? Not all outcomes, particularly these systems level outcomes can be measured directly all the time, but we can also think about proxy outcomes that tell us something important about these structural or systems level um, impacts we wish to have. So for example, maybe we can't uh, directly measure our impact on like housing equity at a societal level. Uh, that's really big and, and hard to measure, but a proxy for this might be changes in the number of affordable housing units within the local uh, context or community, or perhaps the introduction of or the existence of housing equity legislation that has resulted maybe in part from advocacy that's directly linked to the project's activities. Those are considered maybe proxies for that societal or social structural level stuff. And then finally, this came up just a few moments ago in our conversation, and I nodded to this coming up again soon. And we also talked about last time about uh, top up versus bottom down approaches to defining these outcomes, including community defined outcomes. So one thing that's really important to think about here, again, we're always going to go back to feasibility and what is feasible to measure based on what you're actually doing, right? Like I said, you're, you're doing things, you have activities, and we do need to stay rooted in that. So depending on your project's outcomes, uh, community input on the theory of change and evaluation process will just look different depending on your context. Um, when involving service users and community members, stakeholders in the process of specifically of defining outcomes, it's really important to stay rooted in what is feasible and what is connected to what you're doing, your activities. So for example, the early literacy program example that I offered, um, I can't include outcomes that aren't related to the activities of my early literacy program. I may consult with parents in the community who have taken part in the program, and they may say that parental access to social support is an outcome that they really want to see. It's something that's lacking in the community. They want to see that as an outcome. But if my specific program is already running and the activities are all geared towards supporting reading proficiency in children, it doesn't make sense for me to measure parental um, social support in that situation. So I do need to be very realistic if I'm consulting with community about, what's that, about what I'm asking and what's feasible that I can actually take in and, and measure, what outcomes can I actually uh, measure as they relate to my um, my programming, what I'm actually doing. So um, we have a little bit of a plenary question here, but we are over time. So what I'm going to suggest 
Um, my, my plan for actually asking these questions was to acknowledge that these are big questions that folks probably might struggle to answer right now. I really wanted to pose them and get folks thinking before the break. So we're just going to do that. And then you can always bring in your reflections when we go into the small group uh, breakout rooms right after the break. Um, so the questions I'm inviting you to reflect on as we move into our, our seven minute break is uh, what levels of analysis are represented in your projects, maybe your project's desired outcomes from individual to parents, families, organizations, then going up to community and sort of systems level outcomes. Uh, which of these can be feasibly measured? Um, and what outcomes might be even let me, less feasible or harder to measure. Um, so I'm going to um, stop my screen share there as we go into the break and we will come back to this. Um, I forgot what screen I was on for a second there. I'm going to keep my eye on the chat. So if there's anything burning that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I just need to get this out. Put it in the chat before you leave for a break. We are going to take um, a seven minute break. So we'll come back at 2.55 Eastern Standard Time. I currently have 2.48, so we'll come back at 2.55. I invite you to turn off your mic and camera during the break so you can sort of go do what you need to do. And um, I apologize for rushing into the break, but we'll come back and we'll slow down and chat after at 2.55. Have a good break, everyone. All right, so <clears throat> I know we still have folks trickling back in from the break, uh, so I will take my time explaining the small group reflection and plenary report back so folks can um, uh, trickle in as uh, as needed. Um, so let's just get right into that. So similar to what we did last time in workshop number one, we're going to go into um, facilitated breakout rooms. So there'll be at least one hub person uh, facilitating the conversation around these key questions. Um, and then we'll do a report back to the larger group. While you're in your breakout rooms, um, I will not be facilitating one of them um, because you will be populating a Jamboard just like last time responding to these questions with, you know, populating it with post-it notes and stickies um, with your facilitator. And I will be able to kind of look across the, um, the breakout rooms and uh, just sort of see how the conversations are developing. Um, at the end of that, you will then, at the end of that time, you will nominate one person to report back. It can be the hub facilitator or it can be one of you, whatever you prefer. Um, and then we will come back into our large group conversation. Um, and do that report back before we get into the wrap up stuff. So the questions we're um, asking you to reflect on, in addition to, I know I left you with reflection questions at the end of, um, or like right before the break, so that those are a great starting point and those might be how you move into this conversation that's all related to outcome measurement and all of these things. Um, these questions that we're posing here are, first of all, what key outcomes are you planning to measure? Um, and if you haven't already defined outcomes, that's okay. Uh, but what process might you take to defining those outcomes? So if not backward mapping, if a different approach um, or, you know, mixture of different approaches, that's okay. And then how might you operationalize these outcomes so that you can measure them? How will you actually make them make sure you can measure them? And then what are the key measurement barriers that you are experiencing or anticipating? You may wish to start with that second question. Sometimes it's easier to define those barriers barriers before getting into the more um, uh, generative work of defining outcomes, that's okay. Um, so I am going to invite, um, I think it's Eric, to put us, put us in our breakout rooms and uh, enjoy your conversations. I'll be uh, watching the jam boards, um, which should be in the chat. No, they'll be in the they'll be in the individual breakout. It will be shortly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, have a good conversation in your breakout rooms, and I look forward to our report back.